And we're live. Welcome everyone to yet another excellent vestibular first journal club, sure to be we have a very exciting topic tonight. November's topic is the Kurtzer hybrid maneuver for treating a horizontal canal BPPV. And of course we have with us a very special guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Teherna. I hope I'm saying that right. I should have practiced more. Yes. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So um, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Stephen, um, he is a physical therapist. He is an educator. Um, he is a management person. He's got many hats. Um, so we're really happy to have him. He uh, co-leads, I believe, still Evidence CEU. So if you're mm -hmm. not familiar with that group, we'll be talking about that more fantastic opportunities for education and mentorship. So if you want to go ahead and delve a little deeper into uh, just kind of your background and how you got into vestibular briefly, we really appreciate it. Sure. So uh, my name is Stephen T. Harina. I am a doctor of physical therapy and I practice in a south suburb of Chicago called Orland Park. Uh, my journey to vestibular was one of just kind of being thrown into it. Our clinic owner had a vestibular specialty in the clinic and he hired me and I had very little vestibular experience and it was trial by fire. So <laughs> jumping into evaluations and examinations, I remember my first vestibular examination, um, we started it out and then he just walked right out of the room and said, okay, take it from here. Um, so from there, really, it was just a deep dive into vestibular, grab as many research papers as you can grab to learn as fast as you can. I took the APTA kind of sponsored Emory course through, um, through Duke University, um, and they actually hosted that at university um, in California, so a little odd, but it's a, <laughs> it was a fantastic course, and it really kind of just confirmed what I knew working in a clinic with a high volume of vestibular patients, and then from there, it's just been working with my boss to develop a continuing education company that um, provides vestibular education, and then again, grabbing as many research papers as you can and trying to stay up to date on everything that's coming out in the vestibular world. So that would be my background. Hopefully that's pretty helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. No, I mean, I think your story probably rings uh, familiar to some of our uh, folks out there watching. Um, I have heard that story from other clinicians or they might've had some inkling of interest, but it was a, the need and the demand that really uh, have has kind of driven them to uh, kind of grow into a role. So um, it's, a, it's a good thing, you know, to be challenged. So <laughs> look how well it's turned out for you, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to jump right into our topic because you have a lot to cover. It's a very uh, interesting topic, like I said. So uh, we're going to switch over to our slides. And here we are. So again, the topic, horizontal canal, benign paroxysmal positional vertigo treatment, specifically the Kurtzer hybrid maneuver is what we'll be discussing tonight as an option. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, I know we have a variety of people from novices to very experienced clinicians who've watched this, uh, just to kind of orient everyone to where the vestibular apparatus lives inside of our inner ear, past those hearing structures, and then neighbor to the cochlea there. And here is a kind of um, representation of our vestibular apparatus. We know that it has three canals for directional sense, uh, the posterior canal, anterior canal, and horizontal canal is pictured here. This is relevant because we're about to talk about a special condition called benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. This is when the tiny little crystals, as they're often referred to, or otoconia, the fancy term, um, they're supposed to live in uh, kind of the center part of that vestibular apparatus sensor, but sometimes they become displaced um, from a certain part of that um, central area called the utricle, one of our uh, otolith organs that senses directional movement. And so these conia become displaced and they find their way into one of the canals where they do not belong. I like to tell my patients that they're having a party in there, uh, <laughs> which hopefully makes it feel a little bit better that they're feeling like they're spinning, uh, which, you know, some people might feel after they party anyway. So uh, we know that otoconia sometimes are floating in the canal, and sometimes they can stick to the membrane that lives at the end, kind of the far end, if you will, from where they belong of the canal, and that uh, membrane is called the cupula. 
And uh, good to note that these little crystals, sometimes they'll dissolve in the fluid that fills that whole system. And sometimes they will hang out in the canal or stuck to the cupula for months. What do you think is the longest standing case that you have at least been has reported to you by a patient for BPPV, Steve? The longest one I can think of is probably be 20 to 25 years. Wow. <laughs> yep. And it was a, it was a patient with cupulolithiasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you cleared it, I presume. Yeah, we did. <laughs> it, took, it, it actually took longer than expected, but given the 25 year history, we thought that was probably okay. Probably took about five to six treatments to clear. Yeah. Well, I think the literature, if I'm not mistaken, states that it is not unexpected for one to three sessions to clear what they'll call a simple case. Um, so I think mm -hmm. of that as uh, probably canalthesis and single canal and probably posterior canal would be the simplest. And then past mm -hmm. that three to five sessions is not, you know, out of turn for um, maybe multiple canal or stuck to the cupola pretty well, which sounds like mm -hmm. was your uh, situation <laughs> there. Um, yes. So yeah, I think that really uh, matches up with the literature as I know it. Um, so good job <laughs> clearing that 25 year. What did the patient even think? They're probably like, whoa, I can feel differently. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, they, they didn't sleep lying down. They slept in a recliner and uh, they were very happy. And we had to work on eventually convincing them to lie down flat. Right. It, was, it, it was just a practice for them for sure. Yes, that can be quite the, the leap. Um, and before we leave this slide, I'll give a nod to Sonia Vavan, who I pulled a, a picture here. So I always try to acknowledge um, other physios who are out there. She's up in Canada doing a fantastic job. If you don't follow her um, on Insta, you should, because she does lots of funny uh, vestibular specific um, posts. So recommended. Uh, to our kind of different options to treat when otoconia are stuck to the cupula in the horizontal canal specifically. Okay, so since this Kurtzer hybrid maneuver we're about to discuss is designed to treat when otoconia are in the horizontal canal, let's talk about kind of some other options that people sometimes use. One is the Gufani. So you see it, uh, kind of the steps listed here. The person is sitting in short sitting. You're going to have them lie down onto the affected side briskly, right? They stay there for about 30 seconds. The head is turned quickly downwards, or excuse me, upwards, ugh, 45 degrees away from the affected side. So nose up on this one. And you stay there for one to two minutes and you sit up slowly. And I did not make a slide that shows why each one should work. Um, but there's literature out there that you could find that shows, you know, well, if the hodokonia is here, then this should, you know, help them to fall down into a canal. And then as they come up, it should slide this way and that sort of thing. So um, all of these maneuvers are based on at least what we'll call a theoretical understanding of the kind of alignment of the horizontal canal and how gravity works and things like that. The other thing that's a little complicated is there's this kind of concern about the horizontal canal, which side um, of the cupula, uh, if it is cupulothiasis, that the otoconia might be stuck. So it can be stuck to the far side, as I mentioned, kind of um, on the far side of the canal, or remember how the utricle is uh, kind of a neighbor to both ends of the canal. So sometimes it might just scoot a tiny bit in, but still could stick. Um, to that side of the membrane, kind of what we'll call the membrane that's closer to the utricle um, and that side of the membrane. So, um, you know, there's been different proposals as to which side <laughs> it might be stuck based on if you do a more detailed assessment. I think that's um, challenging, although not impossible to learn, but um, sometimes people just try one maneuver and if that doesn't work, they'll try a maneuver that's maybe trying to address if they're stuck on the other side and see if that works. So. You know, um, I won't go so far as to call trial and error, but it's certainly just kind of plan A, plan B <laughs> um, for that. And do you use the Gufani routinely or what is that um, something you might use? Yeah, I, I do try to figure out what side it's on. It can be a little challenging when you're looking at different variations in eye movements and recorded um, <laughs> eye movements are really helpful. So if you have a pair of infrared goggles, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, typically, my go-to is the Kasani um, with the head down. 
And then I will, if I'm not having any success there and I'm unable to determine via eye movements, then I will switch to the Gufoni and typically have good success with that. So it's all kind of get the accurate diagnosis and then trying to apply the correct treatment is typically our go-to method. Right, and I think you and I have probably both encountered cases where it becomes trickier, um, like for someone who has a unilateral hypofunction as well as BPPV, and then you can yes. get a lot of different horizontal eye movements, <laughs> and you're really trying to figure out uh, which side is affected, and you know what the strength of a beat does that have to do with a hypofunction that's constantly pulling that eye to the right anyway versus um, what's happening with BPPV. So, um, it's not the majority, thank goodness of the cases, but it's certainly something I've encountered. Um, and I yes. bet you, you have treated enough that you've encountered it as well. We, we just, we just had one today. So yeah, yeah 100%. Exactly. So be that as it may, that's why I point out, especially for new clinicians, I'd say to, the ability to always kind of figure this out is not necessarily easy. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but that's why good training um, and the ability to see the eye movements and play back and, and review with a mentor, all those things uh, can be very valuable. Uh, so let's go to another option here. So this is for if they're floating free, uh, that horizontal canal canalithiasis called the Appiani. And you can see it listed here again, you're lying down on the unaffected side this time, staying in that position for one to two minutes, turning the head towards the unaffected side, nose down. Um, and then you sit up with the head remaining turned before you put it to midline once they're upright. Um, so how do you feel about the Appiani, Steve? Uh, I, this is probably my go-to maneuver for horizontal canal canal thiasis. I, I love the fact that it's two positions for patients. It doesn't require a ton of mobility, like rolling on the bed. Mm -hmm. So it's typically my go-to if it's free floating. Um, and then I'll use other maneuvers if it's free floating and we're not having success with the Appiani, something right. like a barbecue. Roll. Right. So it's interesting because the barbecue roll, you know, to me, I mean, I've been doing this for long enough, I probably have a sense that that was kind of the original, if you will, uh, which doesn't make it bad in any way. In fact, <laughs> you know, it worked. So that's why people were, were trying it, right? And, um, I think the literature on it is probably the strongest because it's the oldest that I'm aware of for specifically treating horizontal canal canal thysis. Um, but you're right. I think there's mobility demands to the barbecue oil because the person has to go through kind of a full, um, at least uh, not necessarily a 360, but let's say at least a 270 uh, more mm -hmm. or less with head turns and body movements. So that can be difficult for some. Um, but I think it's comfortable in a sense that if that's what a clinician learns, and I think this is not a bad thing that we kind of tend to, okay, well, I had really good instruction on these three maneuvers. I feel comfortable with them. So that's what I'm going to use. And, and again, I'm not saying that's bad. I think it's good. I think the more we grow, hopefully we kind of take the opportunity, even if we just practice on our colleague at first, you know, to say, okay, let me see if I can get good to the Sapiani just in case that is easier for my patient. Um, but yes, it's, I think, uh, a good maneuver and definitely can, can be very successful um, in my experience as well. So next up, the Kasani, also designed for, as you mentioned already, horizontal canal cupulothiasis, so kind of an alternative to the Kasani, especially because it is proposed to address if the otoconi are stuck on the other side of the cupula. So you're short sitting, patient goes down into side lying on the affected side, head is rotated down, nose is down, um, two minutes, one or two minutes. I feel like all of these are kind of guesses on the timing. <laughs> That's my theory on these timings. Yeah. They're like long enough to hopefully something will fall off or float in the right direction, <laughs> which usually is at least, uh, it seems like a minute is probably the old global standard um, minimum uh, to try to get things going. Um, so you mentioned that you do use the Kasani. I have used it as well. And with mixed success, I would say, I think, again, it's one of those things where sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then we might try alternatives. So the Kurtzer hybrid maneuver, which is the focus of today's discussion, is a mix of all of these, believe it or not, um, in a way. So there are some kind of elements that are changed a little bit, and we'll talk about that. So the overall order here, and we're going to talk through each step in a moment, is you're doing essentially a Gufani, and then depending on which side is the affected side, because this maneuver does not require you to be certain of that. 
Um, it would be essentially an Appiani or a Kasani, um, but you're doing the same movement in the sense that the person is lying on one side and the nose will be down. Um, then do another Gafani and then another Appiani slash Kasani. So let's talk that through. So here's this kind of modified version of the Gufani. The patient is lying on their subjectively weaker side. Um, and it says that you can really start on either side, but the patient will probably tolerate the weaker side, the side with less symptoms better um, because it's less symptomatic. So why wouldn't they want to go on that side first, right? Um, and the patient is kept there with nose up, 30 degrees of neck flexion for one minute after the nystagmus decides. There's that magic one minute, <laughs> right? Um, now, they don't specifically say brisk here in the paper, um, and that's uh, something to note. So I know you had mentioned, I had asked you before this talk, had you used the Kurtzer hybrid maneuver? Um, can you talk about, like, do you kind of perform it to the letter, or do you have any kind of modifications to this step in particular? I do. I typically do add in the brisk portion. I've had instances where I've done the Kurtzer hybrid maneuver without adding in that brisk head turn, especially with the head down or on the like the third or fourth position with the head up. And when I did perform it with a brisk head movement, allowing for larger amplitude and higher speeds angular motion, I feel that it was more effective. We were able to dislodge the adhered otoconia in cases with cupular lithiasis. So I feel like that brisk portion is, is important. That's just personal experience, but I do feel like it is important. Right, and, and something we'll already mention later on, but you know, the more research we have on any one maneuver and comparing different maneuvers, it's definitely still a growing area. So a lot of it, we, we have to go on some mix of experience of our mentors or our own experience to try to you know mm -hmm. make do until we have that data to say, yes, we should do it this way, not that way, or what have you. So very good input there. Second step, patient is still on that sideline position on our, uh, the weaker side um, or either side really. They are gonna turn that nose down, um, still with that 30 degrees of neck flexion. So what they describe here is that if um, there was geotropic nystagmus um, during the roll test, you're doing essentially an apiani here. Um, and if it was apogeotropic, which would indicate cupulothiasis, you're doing essentially a Kasani here. So the concept is the same in the sense of what you're physically doing, um, that they're on their side and their nose is down. Um, and we're staying in this position one minute after the nystagmus subsides. Third step uh, essentially is another Gafani. So the person um, is still having, um, they're staying on the table essentially, but they're rolling over their lower bodies. So you see how their knees have turned to the other direction um, and the head is turned with the body essentially in a way in the sense that the nose is now up instead of down. So we're kind of again in a modified because there's no speed here, at least the way it's described, um, mm -hmm. Gufani. Um, again, if there's any nystagmus, which you know there may or may not be, we know as we go through maneuvers, sometimes things are drifting or they're kind of more dispersed as we move through a maneuver. And we know it's not necessarily a fail just because we don't see nystagmus at any point <laughs> in a maneuver per se. I mean, there is research for posterior canal that says that seeing it can be reassuring if it's going, you know, um, the way we want it to. <laughs> but ultimately, it's not required to have a successful maneuver of any kind. Um, is that your experience as well, Steve? I would agree. I love I love seeing the eye movements. <laughs> They're helpful. <laughs> They're confirmatory. But you're completely right. You'll have those patients that will... Um, you'll go through the maneuver, you won't see any nystagmus, and then you sit them up, and then you go the second time, and it's completely abolished. So I've seen it both ways, but it is reassuring for sure. <laughs> so yeah. I, I do love to see it. Right, right. But it makes sense to me that there's so many considerations as far as how many otoconia might be out of place, uh, whether or not they're clumped together, you know, kind of Again, that speed and kind of are they accelerating versus kind of drifting doesn't mean they're not moving just because they're drifting. And I think playing with our fluid filled anatomy model, <laughs> um, it's fun because you really do get to see, I was just explaining to a patients today, like, yep, this is anatomically accurate. This is how slow they sometimes move. Even if I shake it, sometimes they're sticking to the side of the canal. And it's really true. This is what happens. We know that the canals aren't even smooth, right? They're actually a little crookedy. So it's easy mm -hmm. um, for them to kind of 
get stuck and kind of have to wait and then let them tumble down. So you might get the sudden whoosh like halfway through a position, you know. Um, so I think it's good to kind of keep that in mind as we go through. So next position, again, this is kind of nose down now, Apiani slash Kasani um, for that other side because we're side lying on the other side from where we started. Um, again, keeping that 30 degrees of net flexion, we're just kind of following the plane of the horizontal canal by doing that net flexion all the time. Um, and again, nystagmus, if it's there, we wait uh, one minute or one minute after it subsides either way. So that's the final position. Um, is there any position in this where you tend to see, like certainly with the, the modified Epley, that last nose down position, you might get that kind of dump um, of the otoconia and kind of more symptoms. Do you feel like this has that same flavor or not necessarily? I don't know if I've seen it as much. Uh, I have seen sometimes the most, um, maybe the most intense nystagmus response is on that up portion when you bring the head into the gufoni position. It, either you're um, converting a cupular thiasis variant to a canal thiasis variant, or you're going to get like a huge rush of that otoconia through the canal. So I tend to see it on the head up position the most. Um, but That's that would that probably second, just be the second Gafani, not the first. Gifani. Yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> okay. the second Gafani. Yes, got yes, it. Like halfway sure. through the maneuver. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So if I'm clearing that, then it's great to see it, and then we're like, okay, we have to make sure we might have to go through this one more time because we right. converted it. Right. Definitely. All right. Good deal. All right. So the, the fifth optional step they list in the paper that we're discussing is a retest um, that you could do. So the patient's already still in that same sideline position. You're not rolling them over at this point or anything, but you're just bringing their head back to center line, midline, if you will, so that their nose is parallel to the floor, essentially. And they say that if there's no nystagmus, the BPV is likely cleared. And you can pretty much do a similar thing after the end of your um, barbecue roll or lumber, whatever you like to call it as well. Um, if you haven't tried that, <laughs> I'm sure you have, but I mean, for the folks at home. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a good kind of check because you're already in that kind of supine roll sort of position in a way. So we're gonna play through this uh, video just so we can all see it in action. This is a brief overview of the Kurtzer Hybrid Maneuver. For detailed information, see our extended video linked above. While sitting on the edge of a bed or flat surface, turn the head to one shoulder and lie down on the opposite shoulder. Sometimes this is nice to see. The nose should be facing the ceiling and the neck should have 30 degrees of flexion towards the uppermost shoulder. your courses, Steve. Hold this position for 60 seconds. I love showing it to patients too. That's so true. They know what to expect. That's true. That can help. Although sometimes the second it's step they don't is know. to turn the head down <laughs> towards the bottom shoulder while also tucking words. the chin into the <laughs> yeah. chest 30 degrees. Once again, Good. hold this position for 60 seconds. So they're obviously just rolling through the steps. They're not keeping the full minute in the video, but that's appropriate. So they're just demoing Step three here. is to turn the head back up the towards the time. uppermost shoulder. Rotate the body to the other over. side, head is up. maintaining the head this position is where looking Steve up. Was saying you might see that larger uh, amount of nystagmus or symptoms there. Those things are hopefully Hold shifting Hold this and position moving. for 60 seconds. Yeah, Lastly, turn the head down towards the, the bottom shoulder again, while also tucking the chin <laughs> into the chest 30 degrees. And Elena, that's where you were talking about using the faster Hold this speed position with the head for 60 down position mm -hmm. that we've learned from some other maneuvers. Get them going. Test right. to see if the maneuver was successful that's that's by turning the head to the middle there. before I'm sitting up. Vertigo so should be absent. If not, repeat optional. the Kurtzer maneuver a second time. Like the way their gag goggles are hanging off the side of the desk, but okay. All right. <laughs> so that's the end of that. It's got a kind of a nice summary slide of the steps here. So we're going to skip on. So in this uh, study, in the paper that we are discussing tonight, a cleared nine out of nine cases. So it is a small sample size. Uh, only one of the nine needed follow-up treatment a week later. 
and only one of the nine um, got sick. Um, and they had quite an age range between their nine patients, and they had a, kind of a tip towards female, which isn't totally out of sync with the overall, um, it's a little heavy on female for what's out there in the literature for um, kind of overall. But again, it was a small sample size. You can't expect perfect balance on your numbers compared to the population when you're only treating nine patients. So um, that was kind of their results section in summary. So let's talk about kind of pros and cons or benefits and challenges of the Kurtzer hybrid. So one thing that stands out to be as number one is that you do not have to be confident of the affected side. So I can see how this would be an attractive option for newer clinicians who are not as confident, understandably, and I was there and I remember, <laughs> as to interpreting the eye movements, especially if you get that first complex case with the hypofunction underlying or something like that. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. Or someone who has MS, I've had that as well. So they've got some central nystagmus sneaking in there <laughs> on top of everything. It's like, what is going on here? Um, so that's certainly um, one way where you might say, hey, this is something I might want to try. Um, you're only doing the one body movement in the sense of that kind of knee, uh, kind of lower body rotation and kind of a rollover, um, as opposed to the barbecue roll, which does have more body movements to it going into prone. Um, and then it's not the shortest maneuver I've ever done, and it's not the longest maneuver I've done. Um, so it's kind of on the, probably a little bit the longer side. So. Some people see that as a pro because patients are able to kind of hang out and, and just kind of stay in positions and the briskness, although it might be beneficial for moving otoconia, is not there as much. Some people don't tolerate or are not capable of handling for whatever reasons, orthopedic, emotional, you name it, uh, brisk maneuvers. So you may not be able to get brisk out of it anyway. So <laughs> this could be a pro uh, to take a longer time for a maneuver in some cases. Any other benefits that you see that I forgot? No, I think that really kind of covers it. I do think it's helpful um, having a maneuver that you can utilize that treats all different variants of the horizontal canal. I'm thinking a lot of the times when we have patients with residual dizziness and we might not have enough eye movement nystagmus to go off of. So it's nice to kind of take that guesswork out and be able to apply a maneuver with some good confidence that it could be helpful for the patient with horizontal canal variants. So I definitely like that benefit, especially with those weird cases you get where you're unable to determine side. Right. And I think what's also tricky, you know, we talk about canalothiasis and cupelothiasis, like it's either all floating or all stuck, but you mm -hmm. and I know, and I remember there are plenty of clinicians out here could uh, resonate with this, that sometimes some are floating and some are stuck. So, you know, whatever's happening the most is going to be your most powerful eye movements, I think. So often when things are stuck, you're going to see, you know, that apogeotropic because that's a pretty good pull on that cupula making, you know, fluid move in that direction that we would see that apogeotropic nystagmus. Um, but sometimes, you know, it does, you know, convert partway through any maneuver, frankly, that you're, say, trying to clear cupula and all of a sudden you're seeing... Is it geotropic now? What's going on? <laughs> like, you know, so I think the fact that, yeah, this is meant to address not only either side, but also cupulo and canal thiasis, like it's not really differentiating there. Um, it kind of feels like you're kind of catching everything, <laughs> and, um, you know, allows you to kind of feel this could um, help the person regardless of what's stuck and floating and which side. So I agree with that. All right, let's talk about limitations of this study at least. Uh, which there are a few. Uh, so I already pointed out the small sample size, so we're definitely eager for more literature with larger uh, groups using this. So I have looked and I could not find any others. I don't know, Am I? are you aware of any other studies on the Kritzer hybrid so far? No, so far I think it's just the one from 2017. Yeah, so it doesn't mean somebody's not out there doing it because we know that research could take time and sometimes roadblocks like COVID happen. So <laughs> I'm not judging any researcher out there, especially at this point. Um, it's getting live in-person patients was probably pretty tough for <laughs> most people uh, for over a year <laughs> to two years here. Um, so I hope we'll get some research uh, down the line on this maneuver to kind of get a better sense um, of its efficacy or maybe certain cases where it's more or less useful 
um, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, in this particular study, and again, it was kind of a small, I wouldn't know if it's officially a pilot study, but kind of more at that level. So there's no control group here. There's no comparison to another maneuver. Um, no brisk application of movements that they describe, um, which it doesn't make it a bad maneuver. It just means that calling it a mix of those other maneuvers is, a, to me, a little bit inaccurate just because you're not really applying the maneuvers true to form. But I think to say it, it's applying the idea that those maneuvers are existing to kind of move the Otakonia in certain ways, I think that definitely rings true. So I still respect, you know, kind of the, the um, kind of spirit, <laughs> uh, if you will. Um, and I had to put in here... Uh, I have to admit, one of my uh, kind of go-tos for horizontal canal cupulo, uh, which is the Kim maneuver. And I wondered, Steve, mm -hmm. if you have used that and your thoughts on that, and I'm happy to, to talk about mine. But You know, I have, you know, like you mentioned before, you have maneuvers that you're trained in and you get comfortable with. I think I've become like, you kind of become like a Kasani or Gufoni person. Um, I have really not played around with the Kim maneuver that much. So I would love to hear your thoughts. I've, I've seen it done uh, in the clinic. I just have had good success with the other two that I've just really stuck with them. But yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Sure. And I think for me, the reason the Kim appeals to me, well, first of all, I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Ann Galgan, who is a researcher and vestibular leader in the APTA and uh, she has done research on the Kim. So, you know, of course I have kind of a, a more experience mm -hmm. just from her kind of showing her students and I teach with her. So um, her feelings on it just kind of out the gate were that it's essentially a, a version of the barbecue roll, but adding vibration to a couple points to help mobilize the, um, the otoconia off the cupula. So it's kind of mobilizing them and then you're already going through what would treat the floating ones. So that's kind of one of the benefits I would say of this one is that I think it kind of helps again when you have like a potentially mixed case or as you move them off, then you know it's going to kind of move them through. Um, and so for a student to learn like a barbecue roll and then all they have to do is throw uh, vibration onto it to clear the cupulo is pretty attractive. So, you know, given that you cannot expect you know, a student to probably memorize the Kufani and the Kasani, and the, you know, for testing purposes and things like that, I think it makes a lot of sense. And so I started using it just because I was kind of curious um, if I would get success with it. And I have, which doesn't mean that there's been any study comparing, let's say, the Kim to the Gufani. So that would be great. Um, the other theoretical benefit of this one is that it shouldn't matter which side the Otakoni are stuck to because no matter what, as you move through that hole, because you're going through so much range, and obviously the con is always gonna be that you have to roll the body and they have to go prone. So I readily admit I don't use this on everybody. Uh, but if I have a lot of mobile patients, luckily, because you know, I'm an outpatient clinic, and um, unfortunately a lot of people who get BPV are actually pretty active folks. They're doing yoga, I mean. <laughs> so you know, it's not a big deal to put them in prone. So knowing that that's not a concern, you know, and they tend to, not all of them, but some of them are anxious. And so I find kind of not having to do brisk maneuvers is good for that group. <laughs> um, so I think that's probably two reasons that I ended up using it more. And so it really depends maybe even on like, literally the types of people are coming to your clinic. Like, are they yoga folk or are they, you know, somebody who works third shift and sleeps like this? I mean, I'm, I mean, they just saw a study on like how third shift workers get more VBVV. Um, and I have no doubt that it's because they probably sleep in all kinds of funky positions, the poor. <laughs> it's not easy working third shift. I've done it. I used to work security in the dorms when I was in college. So, you know, it's hard to stay awake. <laughs> so, you know, I just think it just probably depends on maybe even the population a bit, the mix you're getting, what might work um, in a way. So it's interesting to think about that at least. So uh, other limitations, we mentioned this kind of not having that brisk aspect, although you can apply it, as Steve said, kind of uh, additive to the uh, original Kritzer hybrid, just kind of throwing in some of those brisk movements during the transitions to try to help mobilize the Oconia. And um, last but not least, this does require some significant neck range of motion. So, you know, they have to have pretty significant rotation in particular. 
And we all know that there are patients out there that don't have a lot of neck rotation uh, in their range. And so, you know, you can modify the critter. I mean, to me, you can modify almost any maneuver if you get enough help or you're creative enough to maybe use some props. Actually, uh, Steve has an excellent video on YouTube. You could probably easily find it on a kind of modifications to I actually think it's focused on posterior canal primarily, but mm -hmm. um, using props in different ways, wedges or pillows and things like that to kind of successfully position folks, even if you don't have a tilt table. Um, so, you know, but as it's written, the Kritzer does require quite a bit of neck uh, rotation. So you might have to apply alternative maneuvers, frankly, if you don't have that kind of range in your patient. So what do you think is the best thing to do for someone with horizontal canal cupelothiasis if they have limited neck rotation? Oh, wow. <laughs> Depends. Oh, so what I normally do, and I will do this either for barbecue roll, Apiani, Kasani, Gafoni, any of the maneuvers you have in the Kurtzer hybrid, is I'm mainly concerned about the head itself. So if the patient doesn't have enough rotation and turning their head all the way to the left 90 degrees, I'll roll their shoulder or their body with their head. So I start trying to just turn them and block. And that typically works really well. So it's almost like with the barbecue roll, you have to turn the patient prone to get their head down. If I'm doing, let's say a Apiani where the head gets turned down, I'll lie them on their side and then I'll just turn their body with their head so that we can get that 90 degrees of rotation downward. So I tend to take whatever maneuver I think will work the best for the patient and then turn the whole body so that I can get the head in the right position, especially if they have limited motion. Definitely. And I see, you know, kind of on groups like Evidence CEU's uh, vestibular study group on Facebook, kind of, oh, I have this patient, I'm in the ICU and they can't lay on their right side because they have a broken arm and leg and, <laughs> you know, all these kind of challenges to your traditional mobile patient who can move through maneuvers and say, okay, how do we successfully treat their horizontal canal BPV or, or what have you. So, I think, you know, having these creative um, alternatives, again, they might require multiple people or what have you, but luckily in a hospital setting, usually you can eke together some <laughs> uh, nurses or what have you, and then you just have to be the commander in chief and say, all right, <laughs> I want you all to roll them this way. Okay, stop right there. <laughs> um, so having worked in the ICU, I have done that. Um, have you also worked in the ICU or are you more outpatient only? I am outpatient only right now, um, but two weeks ago, we had a patient that required three of us to complete um, one repositioning maneuver. Uh, we requ it required also props and wedges, uh, but we were successful, but it took three people and it was pretty difficult. <laughs> we wedged two tables together because we don't have a wide plinth. So we just took two high low tables, wedged them together and, and then used props and we were able to make it work. <laughs> Yeah, no, you do get your challenges now, patient. I don't want to exclude them. It's just, you know, a hospital setting feels like the most obvious situation where that might come up, but definitely you could encounter it really anywhere. Um, home care mm -hmm. for sure. Um, mm -hmm. as well as, as outpatient or, or rehab. So yes, always, always figuring it out. Nice work. All right. So another thing that wasn't brought up in the study, and I'm not sure why is that, you know, they make it seem like it's really difficult to figure out the affected side. And I think there are cases, as we've discussed already, um, mixed cases and things where that is true. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight while we're in this conversation about the horizontal canal, that there is a beautiful option that is, in my experience, pretty effective at kind of helping someone to determine if it's unclear, right? So canalthiasis, the, the stronger symptoms happen on the affected side is, is the way it's taught. And the side that's affected in cupelothiasis during the supide roll test, um, less symptoms is the affected side. Um, is that the way you've taught it as well when you have? Yes, I would say same. We typically just have the clinicians think, is it fatiguing or non-fatiguing? Um, that way we can get the variant hopefully correct. And then we're looking then for stronger side or weaker side for the nystagmus. If it's non-fatiguing, then we're looking for the weaker side. And if it's fatiguing, we're looking for the stronger side. So yeah, pretty similar. Try to keep it as simple as possible. 
Yeah, yeah. Although fatiguing can be tricky again, depending on your circumstances. But I hear yeah. you. Oh, you're yeah. hoping for those for clean, simple for simple cases. <laughs> clean cut cases. That's what we all yeah. <laughs> you're like. Oh, this is great. It's like scoop of chocolate, scoop of vanilla. I love it. All right. So, um, if for some reason you have a kind of an equivocal finding on your supine roll test, one option that is in the literature and that is well supported so far is the bow and lean test. And there's a very similar kind of alternative approach called the sit to supine. It's the same concept as far as you're positioning the person and their head in particular in such a way as to kind of shift the otoconia mm -hmm. and the cupula, depending on whether it's stuck to the cupula or not, whether that matters, um, in such a way that you should be able to induce horizontal beat that would give you an indication of the affected side. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, basically during the bow portion or would be coming up into sitting if you're doing the supine sit test, um, the nystagmus that you induce which should be in the direction of the affected side for mm -hmm. patients with canalithiasis. Mm -hmm. And if they have cupulothiasis, it's that lean or going into supine, either way, um, you should induce some sort of horizontal nystagmus and that should be towards the affected side in a cupulothiasis. And that's the way it's written in the literature. And I have um, personally witnessed this and I think it's nice confirmation for me as a clinician because sometimes uh, geotropic or apogeotropic nystagmus can be actually present in someone with a central condition, for example. But mm -hmm. I don't expect it to follow all the rules. So I wouldn't necessarily expect it to follow the bow and lean rules, for example. That might be kind of, if I'm already suspecting it might be central, maybe there's some other central signs or, you know, kind of things that are kind of <laughs> making me like, be like, all right, is this really peripheral BBV here or what's going on? Um, because I know it's taught and I, I hope that everyone is aware, but just to remind, like just because you induce a nystagmus by a position change does not mean it's BBBV. Um, and I think Steve, you could probably tell us uh, dozens of stories <laughs> uh, of times where, you know, there was a positional nystagmus induced downbeat or whatever it was. And it's like, mm -hmm. okay, this is not necessarily anterior canal BBBV just because it's downbeat, right? So um, these are the considerations we have to make. I think bow and lean is such a great test for differential diagnosis, um, especially like you mentioned earlier before when patients have concurrent hypofunction at the same time, because the hypofunction nystagmus will always follow Alexander's law. So it's going to be unidirectional and it's going to continue to be in that same direction. So with the bow and lean, if you're suspecting or trying to determine if this is like you were mentioning before, a present hypofunction or a canal variant, then putting them in the bow and lean, you're gonna see the nystagmus change directions with the bow and then in the lean position. So it's gonna really help you confirm um, canal thiasis or cupula thiasis versus hypofunction. So I really like using this a lot in the clinic. Perfect, agreed. <laughs> All right. So the take home here is that the Kurtzer hybrid maneuver does provide an option for treatment of the horizontal canal BPBV when it's unclear which side is the affected side. And it is performed the same way for canalothiasis or cupulothiasis cases. And it does not require the patient to be able to move briskly as it's written or to go into prone. Now, I didn't want to leave this discussion without kind of touching on a few additional points <laughs> uh, because horizontal canal, I mean, really could be a whole day's discussion. <laughs> um, but one of the points I wanted to point uh, discuss is, you know, it's really tempting, like I said, to kind of see horizontal canal or sorry, horizontal nystagmus and think, okay, it's got to be horizontal canal BBBV. Um, but we really want to make sure that we're seeing these patterns. So we want to see geotropic or apogeotropic nystagmus on both sides. So if I turn the head to the right and I see the eyes beating right and I turn the head to the left and I see the eyes beating right, <laughs> Steve and I can agree. <laughs> this does not make us feel like it's BPVV, right? <laughs> 
So we're thinking, for example, it might be a hypofunction on the left because mm -hmm. the eyes are beating right consistently, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of where the head is positioned. And, you know, if the, even more so if it, you gaze to the right and it pulls stronger to the right. That's Alexander's law, Steve so uh, adequately pointed out to us a moment ago. You have them look to the left and that diminishes that right beat, but doesn't make it go into a left beat. <laughs> um, that also makes us feel like, okay, this is acting like a hypofunction. And if you see gaze to the left and it beats left and gaze to the right, it beats right and gaze up, it beats up. Now we're thinking central. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, you know, I, I worry about the folks out there who are just trying their best and are treating nystagmus like BPPV and it may not be. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's not wrong to try to figure that out and it's not wrong to apply a maneuver and see if that changes things. Uh, but if you're applying the maneuver well and nothing changes, that's another pause. <laughs> Steve, any other yeah, insights I, to this section? I, I just, I, I love that you stress that not everything is BPPV that's positional. I mean, if you're just doing the odds and you see a hundred BPPV patients or a hundred positional patients per year, you might have one or two that are non-positional, just playing the odds game. And one thing I like to think about is when you're looking at like the central positional research on positional vertigo that's related to central disorders, a lot of times, like you mentioned, you're going to see that concurrently with central findings. But also one of the key defining characteristics is it does not respond to repositioning maneuvers. So if you're continuing repositioning maneuvers and maybe you're 10 sessions in, it might require you to consider that there might be something else going on. But I think you're so right. We need to just be aware and then know when to refer out and be aware that this might not be positional vertigo. Right. And know that it could be something that does not get picked up on an MRI. So vestibular migraine mm -hmm. is the most beautiful uh, example, not that it's a fun thing to experience, but I mean, there is lovely research by Dr. Shinbei, for example, we've had as a previous guest about the types of abnormal eye movements that you can see, including positionally provoked nystagmus. And I think at least close to half of the patients between vestibular migraines, they're not experiencing, mm -hmm. you know, dizziness and maybe an aura or whatever they might particularly experience in their version of migraine, which does not have to include headache, just to remind everyone. Um, you know, so we might see this nystagmus and think, oh, this is acting like BPPV, but just really try to make sure it's following the rules and that, you know, they probably should have some kind of symptom. So if I put somebody into a roll test and I turn their head right and I see kind of a geotropic nystagmus both directions and they're like, I feel nothing. I'm like <laughs> leaning towards possible central unless they're really just someone who's a stoic <laughs> type or something. Um, <laughs> especially if it's really brisk, right? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did want to show a video or two. A patient's give me permission here. Heavy blinker, sorry. It happens. That looks like really good camera quality. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we do try. Uh, so you can see her head is turned to the left. And I'm sure you could give us an interpretation in a moment, Steve. I know you're already diagnosing mm -hmm. as we speak. I'm trying to give <laughs> yeah. everybody watching a chance uh, to do the same. So thoughts. I thought that was great. Yeah, I was looking at it. Now, 
I, I'm trying to determine, I know when I was first looking, I was trying to orient because I couldn't see on the screen yeah. as well, if that was like left or right side, but that looked like when you turned them first to the left side, that it was beating towards the left, correct. which would be geotrophic, correct? And then to the right side, the same thing when you turn their head to the right, that we were also getting geotrophic nystagmus. And then uh, it did look like it was more intense on the right side. If I remember Agreed. Correctly. And she reported the yeah. same. And it was lasting, though, I will say that was the only thing that was a little hard um, with her that made me a little concerned, but it was a little more sustained. But she does have a hypofunction, just full disclosure, um, mm -hmm. t on the right. So it's a little tricky. Um, but yes. So yes, she had definitely a stronger beat to the right. So it looks like a right horizontal canal, canal mm -hmm. uh based on how she presented. So or was it the left? Anyway, she I think she had some kind of mild hypofunction on one side. But again, like, mm -hmm. you know, I think when we think about it, it's not necessarily complete in the sense that like they can still have some active function on a side because we know that there's two branches to mm -hmm. our um, vestibular nerve. And so it's not like you necessarily have a total loss when you have a hypofunction on one side. So um, lots mm -hmm. of considerations there, but definitely good interpretation. All right, so let's move to our next video here. Their research goggles, but still good quality, I'd say. Okay, what do you got there? That was a little odd there, Elena. <laughs> um, so it looked like when you had them turn, and that's a left turn, correct? Yeah, sure. That's head. to the left the whole time there. Yep. Yeah. So it looks like it's beating to the right, but what's go or ageotropic or apogeotropic. But what's odd is it looks like there's some pendular nystagmus going on yes. there. So she has so, a history yeah. of so concussion. Yay, concussion, throwing in a little bit of a, mm -hmm. <laughs> a mixed presentation. Agreed. Mm -hmm. But again, real life, they're not always going to be um, just, uh, you know, one thing, right? Right. So, 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 yeah, what did you wind up determining for that patient? Yeah, let me let me just show you the other video. We're not done yet. Wait for it. So... Go to the next slide here. It's my mouse for some reason. Ah. It's not playing. I'm just having trouble going to the next slide. Give me one second here. Yeah, Helena, I really oh, appreciate though you mentioning, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Stay I was just going to say, I appreciate you mentioning concussion and thinking about like the patient's clinical history is so important also that when we're diagnosing BPPV or any other disorder, we're, we're also considering what's going on in their history and then we get to examination. So I think that's really helpful to know. It is, it is, because if you don't know that or if the patient fails to mention that, which is another issue that occasionally yeah. arises, <laughs> you're like, why am I seeing this? Oh, I've had three concussions. Oh, <laughs> that might explain some of what I'm seeing. Huh. All right. So let's watch this um, other half of the supine roll test for her. So there were two separate videos for you here. So now oh, the same patient that you just saw, now her head is to the right. to be patient. I always tell my students and other folks that I'm mentoring, wait for it.
So very mild, mm -hmm. right? But it was definitely a left horizontal beat again. So we have this apogeotropic nystagmus on both sides. So that is following the rules to me. Um, but one side's not particularly stronger than the other. So I did do uh, the bow and lean on her, and um, she had a right beat. So it was a right horizontal canal cupulo. Um, but definitely subtle. And I think that's, again, where not only um, lots of training, but also um, having the goggles is useful. So something else I wanted to point out is a feature on some goggles out there is a uh, visual fixation light. And so this is a tool that I pull out <laughs> also when things are a little mixed, um, because we know that uh, the literature says that if an astagmus is central uh, source, whether it's stroke, MS, migraine, what have you, um, and you put on a visual fixation light when the nystagmus is present, we expect that either that nystagmus will stay relatively the same or it might even increase in intensity. Whereas if it's peripheral, so BPPV, for example, or a hypofunction, we put on that light, it might uh, either completely eliminate it or at least diminish how the briskness, if you will, or kind of the appearance of it altogether. So that's just one more thing to consider when you're trying to <laughs> figure out these more complicated cases that uh, we can all encounter from time to time. So this is a nice example. This is Dr. Teixido. It's an ENT. Now I'm going to uh, put on a light. light and look at the light. There's the light. There is no nystagmus. Now the light is off, and now the risk nystagmus increases in intensity. The fixation light is now on again. Nystagmus diminishes. The light is off and the nystagmus increases. This is a So he puts it on and off again a couple times. You see the pupil constrict every time it's on. That's kind of one mm -hmm. clue. Since you're not the clinician putting it on, it might not be clear, although he does uh, verbally say so in the video. And then it just, you see that. I believe it's a right beat, right? If I'm kind of orienting myself correctly, which would be probably a left hypo function in this case. Every time he puts the light on, it really diminishes that uh, mm -hmm. nystagmus. He puts it back off, and then you see it pick up again. So I just wanted to get everybody a chance to see that. So one last thing, and then we'll go to questions and answers and wrap it up here. Um, there's some theories out there about something called a light cupula which is essentially a difference in density, so to speak, between the fluid, the endolymph in the system, in the canal, and the cupula, which might occur for various theoretical reasons, um, changes mm -hmm. in the kind of makeup of the endolymph and things like that. It's, it's quite um, detailed in what theories are out there. Nothing has really been definitively proven, to my knowledge. Um, but it can be a possible cause of a geotropic nystagmus that has persisted in nature and does not respond mm -hmm. to well-applied positioning maneuvers. Um, and this is just kind of details there on the right side of the slide of kind of what direction the cupula is moving because it's light, it's floating. When you have the head in different positions, which way it's floating and why that would cause a geotropic nystagmus. And uh, thanks to Vestibular Today, Daniel Tolman, a beautiful site there. Uh, that really hmm. explains the light cupula theories very nicely. Have you encountered what you would call a light cupula? Probably within the last year, maybe one patient. And that patient demonstrated a persistent geotropic nystagmus pattern. They did not respond to repositioning maneuvers well, just like you were mentioning. Um, but they did have mild symptoms. And so once we kind of fell into the light cupula diagnosis, we actually switched our goal to more habituation to the movements and that worked out well, but that took time, graded exposure, desensitization, um, allowing for cupular, where our goal was cupular deflection and allowing the 
the patient to become uh, exposed to that without avoiding it. So that was our route. Um, have you kind of experienced the same in terms of treatment for those patients or presentation wise? Definitely. And I think the fact that there's a competing argument that there's no such thing as like cupula and that it's mm -hmm. just central, but we just can't figure out what the central issue is because let's say imaging is negative or what have you. Luckily, mm -hmm. <laughs> habituation tends to be great for both groups. <laughs> so I feel good about that. <laughs> and I would say I've had a, a handful, uh, not more than maybe four that I can think of in my years that probably that might have been what it was. And I did always go to habituation out of like, oh, well, I definitely can't clear anything here. So let's just <laughs> make it not an issue. Um, and we were able to be pretty successful that way. So. Um, be good to consider, you know, the research will grow on this and hopefully we'll get more. But for now, I think that's a, a safe way to go for the most part, as long as there's nothing malignant that hasn't been, you know, carefully looked for and identified. Mm -hmm. All right. So just a little uh, props to Evan CEU, which is a fantastic uh, set, set of resources available. One is that Facebook group. I recommend you all, if you're not already belonging, to join beautiful discussions about different patient situations, resources, you know, as they come up, educational opportunities, uh, the free vestibular article of the month. And uh, there are live and online courses available through Evidence CEU if that's something you need, including a PT assistant specific track, which is fantastic because I'm not aware of any others out there off the top of my head that specifically cater to that group that definitely is appropriate to treat um, some of our vestibular patients out there and more. So I'll let Steve uh, delve into that just briefly, and then we'll jump into questions. Yes, I big push. Please join the Facebook study group. I think right now we are the largest vestibular study group on Facebook with, I think, over 2,500 clinicians. Uh, so that's our, our claim to fame. It's a great group. We love the discussion. I love that it's just kind of a free for all at times, which is good and bad, but really everyone is able to ask questions. We have complex patient cases that we discuss. We have simple questions like, hey, what's a good goggle uh, brand to recommend? Or what are some videos that we can use for repositioning maneuvers? So it's a really good discussion and area to kind of grow as a clinician, uh, find mentors as well in that group. And then in terms of more, we do have a podcast called Dizzy Discussions, The Clinician's Guide to Vestibular Rehab, where we have uh, clinician interviews, we've done research reviews. So it's a really fun way to learn more. And one of my favorite discussions we had, we actually had a peds vestibular therapist, which was a new area for me. So I felt like I learned a ton. So that's one of my favorite uh, episodes we ever did. And then we are, um, we actually hosted our first hybrid course so COVID kind of changed the, the landscape for continuing education. So in-person courses were difficult to have. So we launched online course options where we did seven weeks of vestibular learning. So each week we had a new module that was launched. And then this past month, we had our first hybrid course that met. So they had seven online vestibular lectures. And then we met in person to do repositioning maneuver training, examination and ocular motor training. So it was super fun. And then next year we're planning to roll out more. And this January, we're doing our advanced vestibular rehab course online as well, where we're going to discuss cervicogenic dizziness, atypical BPPV presentations like light cupula and motion sensitivity. So I'm, I'm super pumped for, for 2022. That's awesome. All right, I love it. All right, we're ready to jump right into our questions. So. Let's go to our question board. Oops, there we go. So thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, here's a hello. Hi, pretty. Uh, <laughs> great points from Andy. Thank you. My go-tos are the barbecue roll and the Kasani says pretty. So we all have our go-tos. What do you use for vibration? So I'm guessing you have something. I'll let you answer first, Steve. Yeah, honestly, if we're going to use vibration, we just use a kind of a handheld massager. Um, that's tended to work pretty well. Um, you can get them sometimes for like five bucks at the convenience store. What are, what are you typically using, Helena? 
Well, I'm high end and I have a hundred and uh, I think it was Ooh. like $30, $35. It's the magic wand. And the reason I like it is because it's multi-purpose. So it has a hundred mm-hmm. Hertz setting and I do use mm-hmm. the vibration induced nystagmus test, which is not relevant to BBBV, but it's a great test. Uh, I think for chronic hypofunctions that maybe I don't, I'm not sure about what I'm seeing on my head thrust test for various reasons they're guarded or what mm-hmm. have you. Um, so it's a nice way to sometimes draw out a unilateral hypofunction and it can be positive no matter how long it's been since it happened. Um, so I just like to know if that's there. So I've been using that and doing that test. And so then I just use the same one um, because it has different levels. If I don't want to use a strong, um, you know, of a vibration level that I can back it off. Um, so I do like the magic wand, but there is like a $25 one. I forget the uh, the name of the brand offhand that I also have that I've used very successfully. It's much smaller. It's like for scar massage for hands. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, there's no like BBV specific vibration tool out there that I'm aware of. It's all just kind of utilizing what's used for like manual therapy. Like the magic wand is really for like massaging your shoulders and things like that, which you can also use if, if you treat, you know, orthopedic like neck or what have you. You may have to do that as a vestibular PT still. <laughs> Sometimes neck, as you mentioned, cervical dizziness is a component. Um, so yeah, I like that multi-purpose nature of the magic wand, but lots of, um, you know, you can definitely go more, uh, on the, the less expensive side and, and be effective, I would say, as you mentioned. So good point. Uh, another question here. Do you have any opinion on the efficacy of this maneuver, the Kutzer hybrid compared to the Zuma maneuver for horizontal canal cupula lithiasis? Oh, that's a great question. I honestly, I haven't played around with the Zuma too much. I have the paper on my desk and we were actually, no, like we were actually planning in our clinic to start playing around with it a little bit more. I don't think there's any studies right now comparing the efficacy of the two maneuvers. Um, so vestibular health, I hope that you start a study. That would be so awesome. You should get some more research done comparing these two maneuvers. How about you, Helena? No, in fact, I don't believe that anyone's done research on the Zuma besides the group that, um, or Zuma uh, in particular, is a, I believe an ENT physician, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't think any other studies have been done besides the couple that he's done yet. So again, it's kind of this challenge of, you know, different maneuvers out there. People are great that they make sense and they're working for those folks, but kind of getting that next level is just in process, I think, as far as starting to do some comparative um, and see, you know, is there any, maybe they're equally effective, which is not bad, because then that means you can apply it depending on other things like how mobile the patient is, right? So uh, it'll be interesting, and hopefully they'll uh, at some point look at, you know, what about the barbecue versus the Zuma? What about the Zuma versus the Xani? What about, <laughs> we'll have to see um, for that. And then uh, Pretty is asking us, does the frequency matter? So I'm thinking this means frequency of vibration. What do you think, Steve? Like you said, I don't know when looking at the research for vibration, if they ever listed a specific frequency. No. Um, so I don't know if it specifically matters. I would probably go to what the patient can tolerate. The idea is that you're using the frequency and the vibrations to try to dislodge the adhered otoconia. You probably could start with a lower frequency and then increase frequency as needed if you're not effective. That's probably how I would go about it. The least amount of force and then progress the force as needed. Um, Because then like we talked about before, you can sometimes stir up other things like if the patient has cervicogenic dizziness and all those other kind of comorbidities. So I would probably start low and then increase um, as needed. And placement to me is the most important. And what I mean is you can be irritated very easily (laughs) by putting a vibration tool on like a cranky spot. So just kind of palpate a little bit first and just kind of check out for tenderness or anything. Watch kind of the bony point, kind of right at the occipital, kind of suboccipital area, I feel like can be tender for folk. And when I'm using the vibration tool, I'm usually going more what I would call behind the ear proper which is above that kind of occipital, suboccipital area, just to kind of try to stay more um, kind of an area that I feel like is generally more tolerant uh, for most folks. Would you agree with that as well, Steve? Yeah, you got to palpate, got to find out where to go. And then you might even have to adjust where you're at, depending on how the frequency is being tolerated for the patient. So you may not, you might have the, um, 
vibrator placed in one position and not be effective and then just move it up a little bit and then the patient has a response. So it's sometimes trial and error, I find. Agreed. All right, last little bit. Andy is suggesting a wall massager, W-A-H-L. So I have to look into that as an alternative as well. So I think that's all of our questions and we're definitely a little over on time, but this, cause this is such a cool topic. So thank you everyone for sticking with us if you did. And uh, thank you especially to Steve for joining us. Fantastic insights and uh, really appreciate your time. So that's it for today. And we look forward to next month's journal club. So keep an eye on our journal club page, social media, vestibular first website. And we've got information coming up for our upcoming journal clubs. So. Thank you again, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Have a good night, everybody.